Good morning. This is Greater Gospel Temple, the Church of Praise and Worship. It's a wonderful day, and I am so thankful to God for everything that he's done, he's doing, and he's going to do. I love him so much, and he loves me. We're going to get right into our Sunday School lesson, and you can contact us. You can call at 214-403-7563. You can also email Great Gospel Temple, me at Great Gospel Temple, GGT Church 66 at yahoo.com. Thank God for everything. I thank God for all of the blessings that He has given us, that He has bestowed on us, for every single thing that He has done. Our Sunday school lesson is entitled Reasons for Joyful Hearts. Reasons for Joyful Hearts. And it's 2 Chronicles 7, verses 1 through 10. 2 Chronicles 7, verses 1 through 10. We'll go into the scripture. 2 Chronicles 7, verses 1 through 10. And let me get back to to seven. Get back to seven. Okay, I'm in six now, so let me go to seven. There is a little place on here where I can go to to seven, but I don't see it. So let me just go in my study. I had left it on six. I was studying six. So. We will go, and I will do the King James Version. I'm in the Living Bible now, but I will do the King James. Because you know how I like the Living Bible, too. But I always go with King James most of the time first. And let's get to the King James Version. Second Chronicles 7, 1 through 10. Now, when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of twenty and two thousand oxen, and an hundred and twenty thousand sheep, so that the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And the priests waited on their offices, the Levites also with instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord, because his mercy endures forever when David praised by their ministry. And the priests sounded trumpets before them, and all Israel stood. Moreover, so, moreover Solomon hallowed the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat. Also at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days and all Israel with him, a very great congregation from the entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. And in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly, for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. And on the three and twentieth day of the seventh month he sent the people away into their tents, 
glad and merry in heart for the goodness that the Lord had showed unto David and to Solomon and to Israel his people. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I have gone past 10. How about that? <laughs> oh my goodness, I have gone past 10. I was so excited, okay? The 10th verse. And on the three and twentieth day of the seventh month, he sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in heart for the goodness that the Lord had showed unto David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. I know God wanted me to go that far because otherwise I wouldn't have gone that far. Get excited about the word of God. I am so thankful. I am so thankful because God is who he is. He's a wonder in my soul. And I am so thankful for that. Now, let's get to our, our uh, commentary. And this is the L.G. Parkhurst Jr. commentary, O-U-O-S-U dot com. O-U-O-S-U dot com. Now, the, the focal scripture is on the 23rd day of the seventh month, King Solomon sent the people to their homes, joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon and for his people Israel. That's Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter and the tenth verse. And our subject is reasons for joyful hearts. So let's get into the commentary. King Solomon dedicated the newly built temple with a prayer that glorified God and restated the conditions the Israelites needed to meet for God to answer their prayers. And we can see that in 2 Chronicles 6, chapter, which I will touch on a bit during this lesson. Now, God answered King Solomon's prayer by sending fire from heaven for all the people to see. Early in their history with the pillar of fire, the Lord led the Hebrews in the wilderness. We can see that in Exodus, the 13th chapter, and the 21st verse. And God sent fire to consume an offering of Aaron, which is Leviticus 9.21. You can go there and read about that. So later, when Ahab was king to contend with the prophets of Baal, God sent fire in answer to Elijah's prayer to consume an offering. And you can see that in 1 Kings 18 and the 38th verse. When the fire came down, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. As King Solomon had prayed earlier, he knew his temple could not contain the Lord, but in some special sense, the Lord was present in the temple and he would hear the prayers of the people when they prayed toward the temple. Jesus spoke of his body as a temple. We can see that in John, the second chapter and 21st verse. On the day of Pentecost, fire appeared above the heads of Jesus' disciples and the Holy Spirit began to fill, F-I-L-L, -L, the followers of Jesus Christ from that day forth. We can find that in Acts, the second chapter and the first through the fourth verses. Because the Holy Spirit, we call that the day of Pentecost, okay? Because the Holy Spirit indwells Christians, Paul wrote, What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. 
as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. We can find that in the sixth chapter of Second Chronicles, the 16th verse. Today, the glory of the Lord indwells the followers of Christ. Oh, aren't you glad? If you're saved, don't you uh, have a happiness? Don't you have a joy that God lives inside of you? Today, the glory of the Lord indwells the followers of Christ. That means he lives inside of us. My goodness, thank you, God. The presence of the Lord's glory in the temple made it impossible for the priests to enter the temple. The temple included the innermost chambers called the Holy of Holies or the most holy place where God was enthroned above both the Ark of the Covenant and the cherubim above the Ark. When a cubit is equal to 18 inches, the Holy of Holies was a cube that was 30 feet long by 30 feet wide by 30 feet high. Only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies once a year. The outer chamber of the temple was called the Holy Place, where other priests and only priests could enter. The glory of the Lord sanctified or made the entire temple holy, and for a time it could not be entered by anyone, not even the priests. And that makes me think about the pulpit, what we call the pulpit. And it's where the, the preachers sit in the church and where the word is delivered from in the church on a podium, a stand. And we've always been taught since I was young enough to even remember or old enough to remember, we've been taught that no one enters the pulpit but the preacher. No one is allowed in the pulpit but the preacher. So that would be the Holy of Holies in the modern daytime. But they let, it seems like any and everybody up in the pulpit. But that today is the Holy of Holies. And I am very, very uh, serious about the pulpit. I don't think anybody that God is not called should be in the pulpit. Now, I'm not judging people. I'm just telling a fact. We've always been taught that, that nobody is supposed to be in the pulpit but the preachers. And I still believe that today the preachers and the pastors, the ones who God has called and anointed. And I still believe that today. Now, he has called many of us. We didn't ask him to call us. And so he has qualified us to be in the pulpit. But the ones who are not called and are not qualified are not to be up there. Children are not to be running around in the pulpit playing. And, and that happens. I remember just a few weeks ago, a pastor was uh, saying that he had said to a young, uh, young person, said, and the young person was in the pulpit, and he said, I'm just telling you, uh, I'm, I, get, I might be paraphrased because I can't tell it word for word, but I can tell you what he said, okay, in my words. He said, that the child was in the pulpit, and I, I don't know whether he was playing or whatever he was doing, but he was in the pulpit, okay? And he told him, said, come out of that pulpit, said, lightning is going to strike you. And said, the child said to him, no, it didn't strike so-and-so when he was up here. Do you get it? God has called certain people for the task and there are certain people like they said here in the holy of holies where the priests were the only ones that's supposed to be in the holy of holies the pastors and the preachers are the only ones that are supposed to be in the pulpit and i, I still believe that i still believe that 
Okay. And if you go up there, like people, you know, there are people who clean the church and and uh, they do different things, duties around the church. And I believe that those people have to be saved and they have to be holy in order to enter the pool pit. Now, I'm not judging. I'm just speaking what I have been taught. And I believe that. I really believe that. And so, I just believe it. So I'm going to go on. Okay? All right. The glory of the Lord was manifested in the fire, as in the wilderness when the Hebrews were led by the pillar of fire, and the Lord gave Moses the law on the mountain. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. And that's at Exodus 24, chapter 17, verse, if you want to read about that. The fire remained for a time above the temple without consuming the temple or the people in the courtyard as the fire had consumed the offering. The courtyard was not large enough to contain the thousands, if not millions of people present at the temple dedication, but the sight of the glory of the Lord would have inspired everyone to fall on their knees in worship. Okay? They showed their humility before the Lord and their unworthiness to look upon his glory by facing the ground as they worshiped. Their true worship included their thankfulness to God for all the reasons they had heard King Solomon list in the prayer of dedication and from their knowledge of the history of their ancestors, but especially for God's presence with them, his promises to them, and his willingness to answer their prayers. By my, 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 my. They praised God with his moral, they praised him for his moral tributes, attributes. They praised him for his moral attributes. First, God is good. God is not a combination of good and evil. God is not arbitrary. God is reasonable and God only does what is good. Second, historically and in their experience, the Lord had shown his faithful love for them and especially on that day when his glory filled the temple. Furthermore, as they looked to the future, they trusted God's promises and praised the Lord that his love for his people would continue forever, which as they would learn by experience, would include both God's blessings when they obeyed the Lord and God's discipline when they would not turn from their sins and return to obedience. Now this verse quotes Psalms 136 and 1. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. As a responsive psalm of reading, Psalm 136 includes the people responding, His love endures forever, after each verse is read. So we can also see that in 2 Chronicles 7 and 6. All right? So perhaps as the priests read Psalm 136 aloud, they led the people in responsive worship. Now we know this is a commentary. And he said perhaps it could have been and it could not have been, but this is a commentary, okay? Now, the king and the people offered sacrifices to the Lord that most probably were not whole burnt offerings where the entire animal was consumed by fire. Most probably they offered parts of the animal in some fat portions while the rest was consumed by the celebrants during the several days of feasting. So we can see more about feasts and offerings, which is coming up later on okay now considering the number of people worshiping the lord who would need to be fed for two weeks of celebration king solomon needed to sacrifice a great number of animals to feed them a portion of each animal was first offered to the lord with thanksgiving and then the rest of the animal helped feed the people 
The dedication feast symbolically represented everyone feasting with the Lord and in the presence of the Lord who feasted with them as a portion of each animal was sacrificed to the Lord. So as Christians, we look forward to feasting with the Lord Jesus in the future, okay? Remember, because Jesus Christ, the expected Jewish Messiah, is greater than King Solomon, Jesus fed thousands of people with just a few fish and a few loaves of bread with baskets, basketfuls of leftovers. So you, we can see that in Luke, the 11th chapter and 31st verse. Okay, that's a little extra that he added into that. But we know that there were so many, many people, but the difference is that Jesus had just a few baskets. Just a few loaves of bread, just a few fish. I mean, not even 10, okay? And then he fed thousands and thousands of people with the little he had. King Solomon had thousands, I mean, thousands and thousands of uh, the, what is it, the oxen and then the other animal that he sacrificed, which is, I want to be accurate, he had, was it 122,000, let's see, let me get up here and see this. I want to make sure that I say the right thing. Fire, King Solomon's Prayer, Elijah, King Solomon. Most holy of holies, the glory of the Lord. Let's see. Now I know I I read that at the beginning. I think it's like 122,000. Now I know it's in here. Let me get up here. To fill the temple, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. My goodness. Mm, mm, mm. Consume the offerings. My God did some wonderful, wonderful miracles. I don't know whether we whether we could handle it today or not. I, I yes we could, because God has conditioned us all for the day and the time that we live in. And we will be able to handle whatever the Lord does. And I am so thankful for him doing everything that he has done, everything that he is doing, and I'm not going to be celebrating for two weeks, and the people ate, he fed the people for two weeks with the leftovers of the sacrifices, but anyway, I'm going to go, go back. And I know it's in there. Okay. Their entire, entire temple was consecrated or set apart as holy to the Lord by King Solomon, including the middle part of the courtyard where the priests would sacrifice, offer sacrifices to the Lord. And with burnt offerings, the entire animal was offered in sacrifice, and neither the one offering the sacrifice nor the priests could eat any of the meat. It was all burned in the fire. The hide of the animal was not burnt and belonged to the priest. So, with fellowship offerings, a portion of the animal could be eaten by the priest and one offering the sacrifice. For the rules of sacrifice, and we can see Leviticus uh, chapters 1 through 7. Solomon kept the feast of the of tabernacles and the feast of dedication so the entire festival would have lasted 14 days in the fall and have fed a vast assembly the seven feasts of israel were described in leviticus the 23rd chapter on the eighth day all israel celebrated a closing assembly and departed for home the 23rd day was the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and the people were so joyful and glad that King Solomon had to, spend, had to send them home from worship and their time of celebration with all God's people. They rejoiced for all that God had done 
for their nation's leaders and for the type of national leadership they had enjoyed through King David and King Solomon. They were at peace and prosperous, and they gave thanks to the Lord for all the good things he had done for them as king of Israel. My goodness. And that he had done for them as a kingdom. And you know, it's so wonderful when you can thank God for the leaders. The leaders are people of God. And they have the people at heart. And that means so, so, so much. I am still looking for this, and I know I, I read that. Now, why am I not seeing that? Why am I not seeing that? Solomon had, it was 120 or 122,000 oxen, and then there were the sheep. So many thousands. So many thousands, so many till he had to dedicate the courtyard in order to make the uh, sacrifice possible for all of the animals and then feed all the people. Now, during the weeks of festival celebration in Jerusalem, King Solomon dedicated his newly constructed temple to the Lord as a place of worship. When he finished praying before all the people, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. That's, uh, during their festivities, we're wrapping it up now. Okay, during their festivities in Jerusalem, King Solomon also fed the people by sacrificing. Here we go. Twenty. 2,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. Second Chronicles 7 and 5. Let me go back up here because it seems like they might have that backwards. 7 and 5. Okay. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice, they have it right, of, tw well, I had it wrong. I should put it like that, okay? <laughs> and King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. I had it mixed up, okay? So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. All right. Thank you, God, for letting me find it and letting me correct it myself. Because I knew there was 120,000 or 122,000, okay? but it was the sheep. All right. Now, there were 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. No wonder the king eventually had to send the people home. Thinking about all the Lord had done for David, Solomon, and all the people of Israel, they went home with glad and joyful hearts. Isn't it wonderful when we have such a wonderful, wonderful uh, time we said didn't we have a good time today in church okay in the worship service when the glory of the Lord came in we enjoyed everything he God fed us gave us what we needed for that day spiritually and we are just so excited sometimes we just stand around and we talk and we uh, still rejoicing and we just enjoy the fellowship and enjoy the goodness of God okay so later and sometimes they have to say okay and they have to flick Flick the lights on us <laughs> so we can just go on, okay? Later in the history of Israel, King David and King Solomon be became models for what the Messiah would do when he came. He would defeat the enemies of Israel and feed all his people. When Jesus came, he defeated all the spiritual enemies of his people. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's Ephesians, the 6th chapter, and the 12th verse. And I want you to remember that, okay? Remember, in the King James Version, it said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But this version tells us, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You have to remember that. It's not against flesh and blood. Now, it's not against a, a being like 
us, okay? But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's evil spirits, okay? Ephesians uh, 6, verse 12. Jesus also fed thousands of people using only a few fish and loaves of bread. Along with his miracle, Jesus testified that he was greater than King Solomon. That's Luke, the 11th chapter and the 31st verse. In Jesus, God was present with his people, meeting their needs. Today, Jesus dwells within his faithful followers. So if you're saved, Jesus dwells in you. He dwells in me. And you know what? If you're not saved, he can dwell in you within a few seconds. And this is what I want you to do. Repeat after me. Dear God, I repent of my sins. I ask for forgiveness of my sins in the name of Jesus. I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And look, that took a few seconds. And if you're serious about it, then you now have God's Spirit dwelling in you. And what you do, today is Sunday, which is a designated day of worship here in the United States of America and for the majority. God will lead you to a, a church that has a leader, a congregation that has a leader that is holy and sanctified and that can bless you. You can, uh, with the word of God, and teach you the way to go in order to continue to be saved, okay, and for God to continually dwell in you. You can reach me at 214-403-7563, ggtchurch66 at yahoo.com. You can reach me also. If he directs you, give me a call. I love you. Enjoy your day. Great Gospel Temple will be back in a couple of hours for the Sunday worship. This is the Sunday School. And the Sunday School lesson is entitled, let me get here to this. It is Reasons for Joyful Hearts, Second Chronicles 7, verses 1 through 10.